uh, hello everybody and uh, uh, thanks for joining i am jyotsna i uh, work for the people's health movement and i have been involved uh, in tb activism especially for access to drtb drugs for a few years now uh, and uh, so this uh, uh, meeting today has been organized by phm and the third world network uh, because uh, uh, of the issue of patents which create a huge barrier to access to new tb drugs uh, tb drugs with new tb drugs especially that uh, uh, the uh, barriers in access to them that we are facing uh, and uh, uh, there's a context to it obviously which is that tb is one of the uh, leading killers among infectious diseases in the world and especially affects the third world the most india south africa are among the worst affected countries uh, and uh, it uh, other than tb it is the specific form of uh, drug resistant tb which has come to haunt these countries the most uh, and uh, the older tb treatment regimens as we know uh, uh, they have existed for a long time but they have like terrible side effects and not as safe for the patients and which really very seriously compromises the quality of life for tb patients during the treatment and even after that uh, but uh, now we have certain new tb drugs they have been discovered uh, after uh, say 50 years like five decades um, but they are much safer they are oral which uh, so that it is easy to administer and people uh, and there is less fall, uh, uh, loss to follow up for those drugs but the problem is that they are really not accessible uh, and the major reason being that uh, it is uh, 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 you have a monopoly of certain companies who have uh, found those drugs and they do not let uh, uh, scale up of production they keep the prices really high and therefore the governments uh, and patients do not have access to these tb drugs we know of three tb drugs which are already being uh, are uh, uh, administered to patients which are bedaquiline dilavanid and pretomanid but there are many more molecules in the pipeline and probably it is good that we are on top of all of this so that we can uh, uh, challenge patents well in advance so that uh, uh, everybody has access to these medicines Mm, so it is in this context that we are having this meeting uh, just to let everybody know that there is a spanish translation and french uh, interpretation available for this webinar if you go down uh, on your window there is a globe uh, kind of a symbol interpretation is written below that uh, people can click on it and then they can uh, 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 hear the whole meeting in the language of preference that they have and um, i uh, there are certain house rules would be made. yeah yeah just yeah. before you go there uh, the french announcement by emily the interpreter oui bonjour à tous cette réunion aura lieu en anglais l'interprétation simultanée est disponible en français et en espagnol afin d'avoir accès à l'interprétation simultanée merci de cliquer sur le globe en bas de votre écran si vous êtes sur un ordinateur une fois avoir cliqué sur le globe vous pouvez cliquer sur français puis euh, et, euh, éteindre pardon, la langue originale afin de mieux entendre. Si vous êtes sur un téléphone portable, vous devrez chercher les trois petits points sur votre écran, cliquer dessus, puis cliquer sur plus, ensuite interprétation, sélectionner la langue, couper l'audio original, puis cliquer sur confirmer. Voilà, ce même, cette même annonce va maintenant être faite en espagnol et ensuite nous pourrons commencer. Merci et bonne journée. Buenos días, Wells. Buenas tardes. Para el seminario en línea de hoy tenemos interpretación al francés, al inglés y al español. Para acceder a la interpretación busquen un icono del globo terráqueo en la parte inferior derecha de sus pantallas, hagan clic ahí y seleccionen el idioma de su lección. Asimismo, si lo desean, pueden silenciar el audio original. Si están conectados desde un teléfono celular o desde una tableta, en vez del icono del globo terráqueo verán tres puntos. Hagan clic ahí, vayan a interpretación de idiomas y ahí también podrán seleccionar el idioma y silenciar el audio original. Gracias. 
Uh, thank you, yeah. interpreters. Uh, these were the interpretations in French and Spanish. Uh, just a few house rules. Well, one is kindly keep your mic on mute if you're not speaking uh, so that we can hear the speaker uh, really well. Uh, and if you have questions, uh, then please put them in the Q&A box. Uh, and uh, for the sake of translations for that also, I will read them out so that they can be trans in English that I would read out in English so that they can be translated in other languages. In case we get questions in other languages, we will do the similar thing where somebody else will read them out. Uh, so these are just the basic minimum things. Uh, we can begin now. So our first speaker today is Lena Menghani. Uh, she is a lawyer and has been associated with the MSF Access campaign for a long time. She's based in India, has been involved in a lot of patent oppositions uh, and uh, uh, so she will take us through a, a sort of an overview of the new DRTB drugs. Uh, what are their prices? What are the problems with patents? And especially with multiple patents on the same drug. Uh, uh, and um, so over to you, Lena, kindly. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll try and speak slowly. Thank you to PHM and PWN for putting this uh, webinar together. Most webinars on COVID, it's nice to have something back on neglected diseases. Um, the first point I always wanted to make is this, that the problem of intellectual property on TB drugs is an old one, ex except that many people um, just did not notice it. The first time we came uh, across a patent barrier on a TB drug was moxifuxacin. It had just started to be used for MDR TB. And uh, you had Bayer who had a patent on the drug in several jurisdictions. In fact, one of the Indian Lina, company Lina. had to. Uh, Lena, just can you speak a little louder? Some uh, it will be better. Okay. Sorry to Is this thing. No, no, absolutely. So one of the key things that I would like to sort of highlight is that the problem of intellectual property of patent barriers. Um, in layman terms, which are monopolies that lead to high prices or non-supply are actually quite old. Um, when in 2008, we started to look at TB drug patents, one of the first ones that we came across was moxifloxacin, which was patented in, for example, in South Africa and was blocking a number of alternative suppliers from entering the South African uh, market. So the generic supply was blocked by the patent that Bayer had on Moxie. Um, that was the first time we encountered it. Uh, we went uh, and supported an opposition on Moxie in India uh, and, and the patent uh, got claims got rejected. The second time around, I think a lot of, a lot of us who worked more recently on TV um, know about it quite clearly is linosolid. Where linosolid uh, was patented in a number of jurisdictions, particularly South Africa, where it was being repurposed for TB and costs uh, 700 rand, accumulating to 49,000 US dollars. And we did a patent search and we realized that, you know, Pfizer had not paid the patent fees. And we wrote a letter to the patent office asking uh, that the patent not be renewed. But nevertheless, it affected a lot of patients uh, who, who just simply, the government simply could not afford the drug at that price. Um, and by the time the patent barrier was overcome, a lot of people with XDR couldn't access that drug. And I'm going to leave it uh, to Fumeza to talk about the problems of uh, linocylid access when it was patented in South Africa. Subsequently, in 2012, we came to Bethacolin, uh, and there was a lot of excitement about Bethacolin because it provided the potential of removing certain uh, toxic medicines from, from the regimen. And that's why I think uh, the excitement quickly uh, came down because one of the key things we realized was that with j, &J they did not only just have a strategy of, of donations to, to countries like India uh, through USAID, but they also had very strategically placed patents in all the countries which had high uh, DRTV uh, burden, which was South Africa, India, Ukraine, Thailand, and so on. So we did the patent search. Uh, we utilized what resources were available, public do domain information from Unicaid and other sources. 
uh, we did uh, the first patent challenge on a few minutes solved, but by the time we got to it, the compound patent had already been granted and that's a similar fate with Deliminet. Now, when you have patents granted, um, but government's not willing to issue compulsory licensing, which is where exactly we are in India, um, it basically means that one of the most important tools, which is pre grant propositions, should be fully realized really upstream in the pipeline rather than later. Um, if you want me to stop for translations, I can. Is that okay? Uh, no, no, that's fine. It is being translated as you speak. Absolutely. Great. So, it's okay. um, so that's where we, we started to realize that the problem with intellectual property was very deep seated, not just for HIV, but for other areas, including TB. In Deliminate, of course, if everyone knows the story today, pedophilin is the backbone, but I think everyone just sort of, you know, does not look at Deliminate as an important drug. In India, where a large number of patients have chloroquinone resistance, you can't just treat with a pedophilin containing regimen. You also need a Deliminate containing regimen. And many patients get pedophilin, but find it very difficult to get Deliminate. And one of the reasons has been the kind of onerous supply lines that the government of India has. Uh, they have one supplier, as we all know, which is Otsuka, and they have one distributor, which is Mylan. And the prices have remained more or less around the $1,700 zone, a few dollars here and there. Anything that is expensive in India, automatically the government starts rationing it. I'll give you an example from COVID-19. You need to give for black fungus for liposomal amphotericin B, uh, you may need to use 100 to 200 vials of liposomal amphotericin B. But it's tremendously expensive. Many patients are being underdosed with liposomal amphotericin B. So that's exactly what's happened with Deliminate. The number of people who require Deliminate are just not getting it because the government supply lines are linked to Otsuka's patent and they find the drug very, very expensive. So I could go on. I think uh, uh, the problems with different drugs is absolutely different. The kind of problems we saw with linoxylate are com is completely different from pedophilin, where the company has strategically offered donations, has strategically reduced prices when compulsory licensing discussions have happened to, you know, discourage governments from taking the route of an alternative producer. So we have to wait till 2023 when pedophilin patent in India is over. And that's when the patents, secondary patents will kick, kick in, in a number of countries, including South Africa. Now, many may argue that we are all buying bulk from GDF. Why should we care for an alternative producer? Time after time, whether it has been uh, uh, lopinavir and ritonavir or liposomal amphotericin B, we've realized that when you are dependent on a single supplier, often you face problems with supply, but more importantly, you could, you know, get a drug for a few dollars, which turns into uh, a, a few hundred dollars that we are seeing with Bethacolin. Even the volumes are rising now with India and South Africa starting to use Bethacolin. The Petominid, it comes as a package. You can't use Petominid on its own. It's a uh, BPAL that you have to use. Can you imagine a procurement where a treatment provider has to uh, procure linoxylate from one source? Bethacolin from another source, which is, of course, j and and then Petominate uh, from Formylin, which is the licensee of TBLI. So even though it comes as a package, it's not easy to procure or to use uh, outside of the combination it's prescribed for. Um, strategically, there were patent applications on BPAL, which were challenged by civil society. And lastly, I would like to say is this, um, that there are molecules that people will talk about in the pipeline. And many will, I, I've often heard this thing, we don't know whether it will actually in the end work or not. I think as civil society in TB, we can't afford to wait till phase three. Patent oppositions must start in phase one. The moment you see a molecule enter phase one, we should be doing the patent searches, whether it's GSK656, Lena Kapravir, whichever it is, so that we can challenge patents very early on. The last point I wanted to make was that while we will challenge patents, there's very little funding for it, but while we continue to challenge patents for it, 
uh, challenge patents on these new drugs, we may reduce the length of the patent monopolies. That means um, we are able to challenge evergreening claims that are secondary claims on the salt or a combination and so on, a polymorph. But what is very key is that often the base molecule could go under patent. And what is a very disturbing trend in TB is that not a single company has been willing to license the drug to either bilaterally or the MPP or in any form for that matter. So that means it's a very monopolistic market. If you do not challenge the patents very early on, we have a chance that we will see the same problems that have arisen with Deliminate and Otsuka that we will see with other drugs. Now, according to me, what has happened with Deliminate is absolutely a violation of the right to health. Individual patients, whether they are children or adults, continue to get suboptimal regimens. Either they have an injectable that could be substituted with Deliminate along with Bethacolin, or they are deprived of a chance to be cured of free XDR and XDR with a less optimal regimen, which is you have a new drug, you have a repurposed drug like Unoslid, you have propozamine, but you do not have Deliminate. And I think this is a really a tragedy that is now playing out in India as we speak. So with all the fanfare of WHO guidelines, we don't have a single word um, from WHO saying that the problem on Deliminate, the monopoly on Deliminate is a real problem, the pricing is a real problem, and governments being willing to do something about it. So I'm going to stop over here because I think whatever has happened with Utsuka and Deliminate will probably play out with a lot of the newer molecules as we go along in the pipeline. Thank you, Lena. Uh, and yes, uh, uh, WHO can go ahead with uh, uh, coming up with guidelines, but unless uh, we challenge monopolies and ensure that the drugs are actually available uh, for governments and for patients to access uh, those guidelines will just become papers on which good things are written. Uh, so uh, oh, Fumesa is saying that she will not be, if, uh, she will take some time before she can come online because her internet is being fixed. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Lindsay McKenna from the Treatment Action Group to speak. And um, uh, she, uh, she is an access to medicines activist for a long time. And uh, TAG has been working on these pipelines for some time. So Lindsay will take us through what are the new TB drugs which are there and we should look out for. And as Lena said, the early we begin, the better it is. Uh, so Lindsay, over to you. Thanks very much, Jyotna. Okay. So a quick outline of what we will cover in the next couple of slides. We'll start with TB drugs in ongoing phase three trials for drug sensitive TB, drug resistant TB and TB preventive therapy. Then we'll look at new chemical entities or new drugs that are in clinical development for TB, starting with phase one, uh, which Lena highlighted as a very important point to start paying attention and taking on these patent challenges. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about the TB drug um, discovery and development landscape. And if there's time, uh, we'll talk about two things to just put on everyone's radar. Um, long-acting injectable um, forms of TB medicines that are um, being developed, and also a TB vaccine candidate called M72ASO1E that is soon to enter phase three. So ongoing phase three uh, TB treatment trials for drug-sensitive TB, drug-resistant TB, and TB preventive therapy are, are uh, summarized here. You can see, you know, for drug sensitive TB, much of the ongoing research is very focused on shortening treatment. Um, it's currently a six month treatment. So the research is really focused on looking at how to shorten treatment down to two or four months by optimizing rifamycin selection and dosing. So um, either rifampicin or rifapentine and or by introducing new and repurposed medicines into first line regimens. And so you see here in, in the parentheses, some of the, the newer drugs that um, Lena mentioned. We have listed some examples here of studies that um, have either recently 
uh, completed and presented results or will do so before the end of the year to give you an idea um, of some, some of the drugs that make up these regimens. Um, there's a four month regimen that replaces rifampicin with rifapentine and ethambutol with moxifloxacin. There's another four month regimen taken forward by the TB Alliance called SimpliCTB that is looking at um, bringing bedaquiline, pertominid, and moxifloxacin into first line treatment. And then there's another trial called Rifashort, which is using um, the first line drugs, but um, increasing the dose of rifampicin to see if that will um, enable them to shorten treatment from six down to four months. For drug resistant TB, similarly, the research agenda is focused on shortening treatment, um, in this case, um, down to six months, and also improving outcomes and tolerability of these regimens by optimizing um, the dose and duration of certain drugs that have difficult side effects and toxicities, such as linazolid, um, and or by evaluating different combinations of new and repurposed medicines. Again, you see here two examples of trials um, that will produce results before the end of the year. There's the Xenix regimen, which is um, similar to the regimen Lena mentioned that TB Alliance has taken forward and patented called the BPAL regimen. It's bedaquiline, pertominid, and linazolid. But in the Xenix trial, they're looking at different strategies to improve the tolerability of linazolid. And then there's TB Practical, which is a study that was taken forward by MSF to look at um, treatment shortening for drug-resistant TB um, by basically taking uh, the same drugs that make up the NYX TB regimen, but then adding moxifloxacin as well. And then finally, for TB preventive therapy or the treatment of TB infection, the research agenda is very focused on filling gaps for rifapentine-based uh, TB preventive therapy regimens in special populations such as children, pregnant women, uh, pregnant people, sorry, and people living with HIV on say, certain ARVs. Um, and for contacts of people with drug-resistant TB, um, researchers are also looking at the ability of levofloxacin or delaminid um, to prevent TB in, in, in contacts of people with drug-resistant TB. So now we have the new chemical entities or, or new drugs that are in clinical development for TB. That means they are currently being studied in people. They've at, entered at least phase one. The table is organized by target. So the drugs are grouped by the way in which they target the TB bacteria. For example, by attacking its ability to make energy, to build cell wall, or to build other critical proteins. Moving from left to right, you see we have listed out the class, the mechanism of action, the sponsor or sponsors, if there are more than one, and then the phase of development that um, each drug is currently in. So we see here we have 15 compounds currently in clinical development for TB. Nine of those compounds um, have novel mechanisms of action which is really important for um, staying ahead of drug resistant strains of TB. Those are highlighted um, in orange. Six compounds of interests are interesting as potential advantage alternatives to existing TB medicines, um, namely clofazamine, bedaquilin, and linazolid, respectively, if you go from top to bottom um, and look at the compounds that are put in red boxes. Um, the reason that these are of interest is because those three drugs that are currently being used for TB, clofazamine, bedaquiline, and linazolid, each have some um, side effects that are challenging, require monitoring, um, or dose adjustments. So, um, for example, clofazamine causes skin discoloration and affects the heart's electrical signal, something um, called QT prolongation, bedaquiline similarly uh, can affect the heart's electrical signal, so requires special monitoring. Linazolid has some challenging side effects, including nerve toxicity, and it can cause certain blood disorders. Um, so the new drugs um, that are boxed in red here, um, in these that share these same drug classes, they are relatives of bedaquiline, clofazamine, and linazolid, may be more potent and have a better toxicity profile than the drugs we are currently working with, which is why um, they are of interest. So 
On the previous slide, um, under the sponsor col column, you probably recognize some familiar names. We've heard Lena call some of them out already, Janssen, which is Johnson & Johnson, Otsuka, the TB Alliance. But there were also some newer names, um, at least some that are newer to, t to TB, including GSK um, and two South Korean companies, uh, Korean and Lego Chem. Um, so these companies are represented here in the box in orange. They make up just one part of the larger TB drug discovery and development landscape. And understanding this landscape is really important to understanding how TB drugs move through the pipeline and various stages of research, and importantly, how their development is ultimately funded, which can um, become very important um, when we start to talk about challenging um, patents and uh, strategies for improving access. So in this figure in the blue and the yellow boxes, you can see where the public private partnerships fit in, mostly in the discovery, preclinical and translational stages of development. The public partner in the partnerships represented by the blue box is the European Union via the Horizon 2020 initiative. And then the public partner or more of a philanthropic partner in the partnership represented in yellow is the Bill and Melinda, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, and in green, we have publicly funded research and clinical trials networks, which are focused um, uh, typically on later stages of development, um, including uh, several research networks that are funded by the US government, um, Panacea, which is a partnership funded uh, which is a network funded in partnership between European and African governments. And then the CTCTC is the China TB Clinical Trials Consortium. This figure is not at all exhaustive, but gives you an idea of who is playing what role in the discovery and development of TB drugs. Um, and one thing to note is that many of the pharmaceutical companies are more active in the discovery, preclinical and early clinical stages. So the stages to the left of the figure um, and, you know, usually uh, when it comes time to evaluate new drugs in combination, um, which is usually the later stages of phase two, then the companies will often look to one of these publicly or philanthropically funded initiatives to help take the compound forward. And the interest in that approach is kind of twofold. First, because it helps unlock access access to other compounds held by other companies that, you know, they're interested in studying the drug that they are sponsoring in combination with. Um, and secondly, access to these initiatives actually helps de-risk their development efforts in terms of the funding required and where it's coming from um, to move drugs forward into later stages of clinical research, especially phase three, which is where things tend to get more expensive and difficult. So on this slide, you can see some of the initiatives um, mentioned on the previous slide that are publicly um, funded. Um, you can see the drugs that they seem to be interested in taking forward in combination. You, we notice some trends here. We see a lot of uh, bedaquilin and delaminid based backbone regimens. Certain um, initiatives are figuring out whether to move forward with delaminate or protominate. And then in terms of the newer chemical entities they're interested in, we see some of the oxazolidinones, which are similar. They're like a sister to linazolid. Um, those include sutazolid and delpazolid. So you can see those represented in multiple places. We see um, TBAJ587, which is a relative of bedaquilin. So we see that coming uh, forward a lot. And then we see drugs that have new mechanisms of access. Uh, new mechanisms of action. So there are two GSK compounds. Um, there's this uh, OPC 167832, which is sponsored by Otsuka. And then very recently in the last year, we saw actually an announcement that um, one of those South Korean companies, Korean, signed a material transfer agreement um, with Janssen for a compound called Telesebec, formerly called Q203, um, that uh, works along the respiratory uh, chain, similar to bedaquilin. And so there's a question about, you know, how Janssen envisions taking um, this drug, which has a novel me mechanism of action, um, but also targets the bacteria's ability to make energy, similar to bedaquilin, um, how they plan to take, to take that forward. So this just gives you an idea of some of these, uh, you know, 
uh, publicly funded initiatives um, and, and what compounds and new chemical entities look like will move forward within the next um, year or two. So earlier this year, the FDA approved its first long acting injectable for HIV administered monthly. Um, there is lots of work ongoing in the HIV prevention and treatment space to explore long acting drug delivery mechanisms. Um, and in 2020, Unitaid actually funded the Longevity Project, which is focused on repurposing medicines as long acting formulations. So for TB, the focus of the Longevity Project is on TB prevention, specifically looking at rifapentine and isoniazid um, and whether they can be administered in long acting form. Um, and these are of interest, rifapentine and isoniazid, because they're the two drugs that currently make up short course TB preventive therapy regimens, 1HP and 3HP, um, that are available and, and being administered orally. Um, for the TB project, it's still in the preclinical phase for longevity. They're figuring out if the University of Liverpool's nanotechnology can be applied to transform TB drugs into long acting injectable formulations um, and community engagement via a long acting technology focused cab that TAG and AFROCAB are in the process of setting up um, and acceptability work conducted by the University of Nebraska is soon to start and will be especially important um, in TB considering the recent um, global move and campaign for all oral regimens for the treatment of TB um, and the corresponding history and association of, of injectables in the TB field, um, namely the amino, aminoglycosides with permanent um, side effects such as hearing loss. So, you know, we just wanted to flag that this project in general, um, that there will be opportunities for community engagement. And, and also that later this year, TAG will be publishing a patent landscape analysis, looking specifically at trends that have implications for the development of and future access to long acting versions of, of TB drugs, as well as um, hepatitis C drugs. I know this you know, webinar is focused very much on, on medicines and treatment, but uh, we wanted to flag this protein adjuvant subunit vaccine called M72ASO1E, which is advancing to phase three. Um, it's expected to enter a phase three trial in 2023. Um, it will be taken forward by the Gates Medical Research Institute, but GSK only licensed to the Gates Medical Research Institute the rights to M72, which is the protein. It's only half of the vaccine. GSK will continue to hold the rights to and manufacture the adjuvant, which is ASO1E, both for the trial and the eventual commercialization of the vaccine should it be confirmed in phase three. Of note, this adjuvant is shared by other vaccines, including the Shingrix vaccine for shingles and the RTSS vaccine for malaria. And one of the two molecules that make up the adjuvant, um, QS21, is actually uh, naturally sourced from the bark of a tree native to South America. Um, and the way the agreement is structured between GSK and the Gates Medical Research Institute, the fact that the adjuvant is shared by multiple vaccines and the way part of the adjuvant is naturally sourced may affect access down the road. And so this is something we wanted to flag as an area um, for early kind of attention and intervention um, to ensure that if the vaccine is proven in phase three, it will be equitably um, accessible. Thank you very much. I put here contact information for the folks at TAG. Um, if you have questions about TB drugs, you can contact me, TB vaccines, you can contact um, Mike Frick and for longevity, um, Bryn Gay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy, uh, for presenting on the clinical uh, the pipeline, uh, what we have uh, in the pipeline for DRTB drugs. Uh, and very important, some of these drugs looks like that can really change the entire TB treatment as we know it. Uh, but of course, as long as everybody can access them. Uh, so taking from here, I would request Pratibha Sivasram Guramanyam from the Third World Network uh, to present. Uh, Sangeeta Shashikant was supposed to present, but she is not able to attend. So her colleague Pratibha will be presenting uh, to us. Uh, Pratibha is a legal consultant with the Tita Fluen. Uh, and uh, it is an organization which has been very closely following access issues in TB for a long time. 
and has been filing uh, patent oppositions also. Uh, so there is, they have a new report which uh, looks at the landscape of patents of DRTP drugs, some of them which uh, Lindsay has already mentioned. Uh, so maybe, uh, so we have Pratibha to take us through the patent landscape. Uh, can you share your screen, Pratipa? So, uh, Jyotna, I'm really sorry. There is some problem with my uh, screen. I'm unable to upload the PPT. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll have it. Yeah. Let can you see? Otherwise, I'll... Yes. Are you see. able to see? Yes. Yeah? Okay. Uh, so... Um, so we, uh, TWN had commissioned a, a patent landscape of 15 drugs in 13 countries. And uh, it is uh, included in the TB 13 countries, which uh, in, it's called the TB, land, uh, TB Drug Patent Landscape Project. And the major objective of this project was to have a better idea, better knowledge about patents on a particular drug and to initiate a proper appropriate international discourse to understand the extent of monopoly or both geographically and in terms of time, like number of years on a particular drug, and to aid and assist in further research on drugs, patents, and related costs, and to facilitate formulation of national policy with regard to accessibility and affordability of cheap drugs. So we had around uh, 13 countries in which uh, the ARIPO means, uh, um, ARIPO includes includes the Anglophone countries, such as uh, like Ghana, Kenya, Mauritius, Somalia, Uganda, Zambia. And OAPI uh, is a uh, Francophone uh, countries, such as uh, Burkina Faso, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Chad, Congo, Senegal. So uh, apart from that, we have some, uh, we have, uh, uh, we have chosen pipeline drugs. And uh, some of them are new drugs which are already in use, like Bedaquilin, Delamanid, and uh, Pretamanid. And some of them are relatively a little bit older, but we chose them because we could, uh, we wanted to find out if there were combinations of these drugs. Just now, uh, Lindsay had explained there are combination trials that are going on. So we wanted to see if simultaneously patent applications have been uh, filed or not. So, um, so I have three points before I uh, begin uh, into the landslide, uh, uh, landscape. One is that uh, I'm, I'm not something that new, it's all what we have been discussed and what Lena and Lindsay have been saying and we have all been advocating for. One is that secondary patents are being filed for key drugs. And uh, second is not, drug companies receive public or philanthropical funding at various stages of drug development of drug, uh, drug development and third and it's important to file free grant opposition so without wasting time i'm just going to the first point that is uh, of the 16 drugs seven drugs had secondary patents and uh, some of the secondary patents uh, some of the drugs that had secondary patents include the dacrylin delamanid gsk656 contazolid spr720 and uh, for instance, SPR 720 had around six uh, uh, patent applications filed. And it's uh, recently that, uh, uh, and uh, it, it, is, it was progressing on uh, clinical trials. And recently there is, it has come to a halt for some reason. But uh, the amount, the number of uh, uh, applications that have been filed include the general formula patents which is almost like a theory, but it includes all the forms like a salt, polymorph, prodrug, hydrate, crystalline forms, et cetera. That, that, uh, then there are, there are special compound patent applications. There are patent applications for salt forms. There are crystalline forms, method of treatment. So one drug has number of patent applications. So apart from that, um, there is a, a some of the drugs have just, uh, uh, they cover only the compound claim and a Marcus claim. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, like Contazolid has uh, been recently approved in China. It has, uh, uh, it has about a crystal claim. It's micro, uh, micronized formulation, uh, particle size of the drug, 
process claims, uh, process patent applications, then uh, the crystal spe specified salt crystals, etc. So apart from that, uh, some of the drugs uh, have uh, just two, uh, two patent applications. But what they do is one, they claim the com compound or the Markush claim. And second, what they do is compound, when I say Markush claim, it is a general formula uh, or a genus patent application, which can include a host, I think millions of compounds. So there is one such application, and then there is subsequently a process claim is being filed that is in Delta Solid, and uh, which also claims the compound. So there is an increase. For instance, the uh, first patent application ends at 2029, and the second one expires in two, two, uh, 2031. So there is, uh, there is again some years of increase of monopoly. So multiple patent on the drug increases the uh, monopoly on the API. And most of this, uh, you can see like Vedaclin has about seven patent applications. Delamanage has about eight. So what we see is closer to the approval, the filing, more filing increase. And uh, next point is that it's something that uh, Lindsay had already mentioned. Uh, and the companies are receiving philanthropic or public funding or contribution at different stages of drug development. However, this funding or uh, contribution is not resulting in increased access or affordability. Of the 16 drugs, about eight drugs receive some kind of public funding or philanthropic contribution. They are Bedaquilin, uh, SPR720, TBI166, uh, BTZ043, TB8731, Celestibex, Sutazolid, SQ109. Uh, so this is, uh, this is about Bedaquilin, and uh, which everyone has been talking about. And this is a study which uh, one of our co-panelists was co-author, uh, Lindsay. And this study, it, say, it, it found that uh, about uh, uh, Bedaquilin had, had been developed by um, Janssen, but uh, academia, NGO, humanitarian organization, government, they all have been continuously playing a role to develop this drug. And um, this drug has received public funding for clinical trials, as well as uh, other public, uh, indirect public contribution like tax base, break, regulatory incentives, etc. So uh, this study found that about the total public investment uh, investment in this, uh, this particular in the development of this particular drug was around US dollars 455 uh, to 747 million, and it is much less than what the uh, innovate originator has invested. So the other uh, uh, example is Telesibex. It's a new drug. And it is, the, it is the same drug that Lindsay was talking about, Q203. And it shows that action against uh, TB. And it's still in phase two. And it's, uh, it's kind of, a, uh, it's, it's said to be a very good uh, synergy with beta uh, But um, it's still in phase two. But look at the amount of, um, uh, it has received a lot of public, uh, public funding. It was actually developed by Institute of Pasture Korea. And thereafter, it was licensed, out, licensed to Curient. And we need to see if this drug comes through and gets approved, then again, it will uh, have the access and affordability issues, unless there are clauses of affordability and access in, the, uh, in these uh, public-private pa partnership agreements that they have. The third point is uh, that uh, if, what is important that we found was while we did the uh, landscape, we also had to file to pre grant opposition. And we found that pre grant opposition mechanism is very important in patent law. And um, it's important to have uh, it, it as a provision in our patent law. And uh, this is, in, uh, for instance, third party observation provisions with limited time to file uh, the opposition is very difficult to file because it's very difficult to identify these drugs. It took us many months to identify these drugs. And um, it is, uh, it's like finding a needle in a haystack. And it's important to, uh, just like Lina said, in the phase one stage itself, it's important to file 
uh, patent opposition because patent applications get filed during that. We don't know whether this, these drugs will get approved or not, but we have to take that chance and risk and file the opposition. So um, um, there are many organizations who have been involved in filing these oppositions along with uh, TWN has supported some of them, NSF has supported some of them, and um, Lawyers Collective, one of the legal organization which has been giving legal aid uh, to uh, patient groups and filing oppositions have also uh, filed some of these oppositions. They are bed, uh, and uh, one of the important uh, achievements for what we saw this year was apart from filing oppositions in India, which has a provision for uh, free grant opposition, we were also able to support filing of uh, pre, uh, a third party observation in Indonesia, which was one, one of its own kind. And, but the difficulty that we faced there was uh, initial, we didn't know what, uh, what was the procedure that our person had to liaise with the patent office. And uh, thereafter, when we filed, we filed in English, we had to file, uh, uh, translate it in, a, in, the, in, the, in, the, in Bahasa. So this all took time. We were, it was, in, it was the first time that it, uh, uh, an opposition from patient groups have been filing, filed. So, uh, uh, Pratipa, and, uh, Pratipa, sorry, yeah. uh, but can you wrap slide. up a little fast? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm done. So, uh, so I mean, uh, there are oppositions that have been filed in Philippines as well. Um, so, in my conclusion, what I have to say is that um, landscape, uh, this landscape had helped to identify key, key patent applications. And the opposition systems, as I mentioned, they are important. And it's important to file oppositions, not just in India, Philippines, and Indonesia, but in every other country which has an opposition system, especially pre grant opposition. And, uh, it is, um, uh, we, uh, and it's also important to partner with organizations. For instance, TAG had helped us to uh, identify some of the key pipeline drugs. And uh, also partnering with MSF helped us in um, filing these oppositions. And uh, there were also other patient groups which were in, uh, which uh, played a role in filing opposition. So um, thank you. Uh, that th these are the things that I wanted to uh, share with you all. Thank you, Pratipa. Uh, so very important. Yeah, uh, I think this uh, report gives us an understanding as to what is happening uh, within the uh, scope of patent opposition, patent, uh, oppositions that have been filed. Uh, thank you for this, Pratipa. Uh, I would like to call uh, Fumesa next. Uh, Fumesa, she is uh, from South Africa, is an XDR TV survivor, and one of the most fierce activists and advocate for access to DRTV drugs. Uh, and uh, Fumesa is also one of the petitioners for uh, uh, an opposition that has been filed in India regarding patent extension of uh, bedaculin, which is uh, Johnson & Johnson's uh, uh, drug. So, uh, Fumiza, over to you. Well, thank you. So, as you said, I am Fumiza Tishilin. I am from um, Cape Town in South Africa. So I was really lucky enough to get the new medication, which is called the Feracoline, but I got the medication called Linozolid. And at the time, it was out of reach and very expensive to those who actually need the drug. So let me give you some sort of background. So what happened was um, I was a first year student at the university in Cape Town, and I saw that I was not well, uh, meaning um, I was losing weight and it was very hard for me to climb stairs. So I had shortness of breath and I was losing weight. So because I saw that I was sick, I went to the doctor like anyone would, and they checked for all common diseases and then they all came back and they didn't show any signs of me being sick of whatever the diseases that they were checking. And then the doctor said, because they don't check for TB uh, at the private center, I must go to the public clinic. And then I went to the clinic, I coughed out, and I waited for three, three weeks to get the results. Just so you know, the gym expectation wasn't available at the time, so I had to wait longer to get the TB results. The results came back and they didn't show any signs of TB, meaning I did not have TB, they did not know what was wrong with me. But then one doctor at the clinic said, I must go to a chest x-ray, and then I was diagnosed through a chest x-ray. 
So I remember them saying that my X-ray is very, it looks very dangerous, and uh, I must start on what they call first line temperatures. There were three little tablets, like easy to take. I had no issues with taking them. But then uh, I wasn't getting fed, I wasn't getting well, I was getting worse. And then they test again, and I tested, I popped out, and then this time around the results came back, and then they told me that I have MDR TB. So I had no idea what they were talking about. I was giving like 25 tablets, and then I was told that I was getting injection every day for, for six months. Uh, no one explained anything about the side effects of the drugs I was taking. It was like, you know, when, when you know something is happening, but then you don't want to believe that it's happening to you. I mean, I didn't think that it was true that I would get this injection every day for six months. And then the worst thing happened. I was in hospital and I woke up and then I could not hear anything. Like when we woke up, we go to the bathroom, we, we opened the tap, there was no sound of, <clears throat> of running water. There was no sound of flushing. So I thought there was something wrong with my ears, maybe something blocking my ears, which I went to the nurse and told her that I cannot hear. She was saying something, her lips were moving, but there was no sound coming out. I could not hear what she was saying. And so uh, she wrote down that I must go to the audio department and I must get checked there. So I went to the audiologist, they did the test and they wrote on my folder that I was deaf. So obviously I was very confused and as to what was happening with me. As to what was happening with me. And so um, I went Meza, to the doctor. The Meza, doctor for Meza, sorry and, to interrupt, um, but uh, uh, can you speak a little slow so, oh, so that interpreters can, yeah. Uh, and uh, if we can speak a little more into the speaker. Thank you. Okay, is it clear now? I'll speak louder. Okay, so uh, as I was saying, Sorry. I thought. Do you have a headphone have... by any chance? Do you have a headphone by any chance? Now. Okay. So as I was saying, I got deaf from the injectable that I was given and uh, I took, uh, it was like the longest, like the longest and the hardest thing that I had to do because I wasn't told about side effects of the drugs I was taking. I was giving 25 tablets every day and an injection that got me deaf. But then they had to check for me again. And then this time around, the results came back saying that I had pre xdr -TB. They saw something unusual in my lungs. Some were assuming, some doctors were assuming it might be cancer. Some some saying that it might be a tumor, but then uh, they checked it out. It was not cancer or tumor. But then I had to do a surgery to, re to, to remove that the liquid that was building up in my lungs. So while I was doing the surgery, um, they broke one of my ribs and uh, the lung, my lung collapsed, meaning I had to stay longer at the hospital. But then I was discharged because I was better pregnant on TV. I gained weight. I no longer got tired easily while climbing the stairs or walking. I got discharged to go back to the TB clinic, TB hospital rather, to consume my, my medication for the pre xdr TB. But then because I was so well, I gained weight, they discharged me to go home to take my medication at the clinic. So nine months down the line, and uh, they told me that uh, the drugs I was taking for pre xdr TB stopped working and that I uh, XDR TB now, and that I have 20% chance of surviving, and that they are sorry, but they don't think there's anything that, that, that the clinic I was going to take into. But then they said something else, that um, there's a drug uh, that is being given, given in, to people in South Africa called the Linzolate drug, and this drug is way out of reach for people who need it, but I will get it through MSF. So they gave me a choice and then they told me about uh, the side effects that I might experience from the drug. And then the, the, I think the most important part for me is that I was given a choice is that you take the drug and hope that it will work or I stop taking the drugs and I will die. And then I, I took the drug and then um, while I was on, on at, at the hospital in, at, in Kylie Chow, I noticed that only a selective few people were able to access this drug, meaning only the lucky ones were able to access this drug, meaning only the luck was able to be given life again, you know, like gambling with people's lives. 
I mean, it was unfair. What about the other people who were, let's say, in other provinces, like outside of Cape Town, who were not, MSF was not there at the time. So uh, I, I saw that this was a problem. That's why I started to block on the MSF TV and block. And I shared my story there. And then I also asked the South African government to fix the patent law so that the drugs should be available to all those who need them. And also um, it shouldn't be profit before patients. I mean, I think that is unfair. What's the point of making drugs for the people who need them, but then those people who need the drugs cannot afford them. But who are you selling the drugs to? Everyone who has access to life-saving drugs that are less toxic and easy to take. You don't have to take drugs for three, two to three years to get cured of something. You don't have to take drugs that, that gives you irreversible hearing loss, for instance, or makes you um, living with, live with disability for life. I mean, this needs to change. There should be life, um, life-saving drugs that are affordable to all those who need it. And yes, thank you. Thank you, Fumeza. Uh, yeah, thank you for sharing your story and uh, why we really need to oppose uh, patents on these drugs. Uh, so I would like to call uh, uh, Anand Grover next. He's a lawyer. He's a founder of Lawyers Collective. Uh, and as we know, it is a leading public interest litigation service provider. Uh, Anand has worked uh, on human rights and has filed numerous patent oppositions. So I invite him today to speak on the re most recent patent opposition uh, that has been filed in Bombay High Court. Uh, and it is for the government use and compulsory license to access new TB drugs. Uh, Anand, you are invited to speak. Thank you, Jyotsna. Thank you, everybody. I, I think people know quite a bit about it, but I'm not going to go into detail, but just barely uh, touch on the petition, just to give an idea about the petition, uh, and then actually address some of the questions which other people have raised, but particularly Lena and Pratiba, and of course, um, uh, others also. Now, as you know, India has a disproportionate burden of TB, MDR, XGR, TB. Um, huge numbers, about 23% of the um, people in who are um, uh, TB positive or MDR, 6% have XDR. And in Mumbai and Maharashtra, where Mumbai is, we have the highest burden in, in, in India. So there's a major problem. Historically, you know, we didn't have treatment which was available all orally. Now we have bodacolin and delaminate. These are produced uh, and available in India, but they are produced and not available to the people who need it. And in fact, the government has been relying on donations um, by the companies who make them, Otsuka by, by Malin for delaminate and Johnson for bedacolin. And the numbers are just very, very low. But the laminin and bedacolin have been approved by the regulatory authorities in India after the WHO recognized them. The numbers according to us who actually need them are huge, especially bedacolin, but they are not made available and accessible. Now we had an issue, how do we go about it? Now there are various provisions in the Indian patent law. The first one, which is the most familiar one, is for a company, a generic company, to ask for a license compulsorily under section, uh, under the Indian Patent Act. And for that, they have to go through a procedure. The procedure is uh, under section 84 that they would actually have a negotiation if they, for, a, for a license from the patent holder. And they have to satisfy that what are called reasonable, reasonable requirements of the public have not been met or satisfied. Uh, the invention has not been made available to the public at reasonably affordable prices, or it is not worked in the territory of India. Now, basically, it means that if 10,000 people require it, there are 10,000 available and they should be available. And also this issue of working the pattern. Either it should be produced in sufficient numbers or it should be imported. 
these conditions are actually satisfied for an issue of a compulsory license and on the application of a generic company because a private person may make an application, but if they don't have a generic company to manufacture the drug, they will not get the license. This has been tried earlier and it's only worked in one case, sorafenib tosylate, which was to treat kidney and liver cancer and we succeeded. And the, the numbers went up in terms of production, they're made available and at nearly one tenth of the cost. So that was a good thing, but that was the only case that we've got. Now, the other option is actually getting the government to issue either what is known as government authorization under section 100 or a compulsory license under section 92. Now the government has not been acting despite the fact that the Indian government has been proposing, propose, uh, propagating the idea of a TRIPS waiver, they are not doing that sort of thing in India. They are in fact opposing compulsory licenses on COVID repurposed medicines or COVID vaccines in India. So there is dissonance between the local uh, attitude they have taken and the one that they have taken at the TRIPS Council. So how do we make them change their view. We obviously have written letters to them through the petitioners uh, who are actually uh, ex-TB uh, uh, survivor. They're, they're TB survivors, persons who had actually gone through TB and faced the same problems as our friend from South Africa has faced. Um, we also filed right to information applications so as to get the exact idea of the numbers. And according to us, the numbers who needed um, uh, Bedecolin was about 55,000. Uh, and Delaminid was according to us who needed about 1,000 and they were not getting it. So we actually filed a petition asking for a mandatory order because the conditions for the issuance of a government authorization or compulsory license were satisfied. As I told you, the government authorization is under section 100 and the compulsory license is under 92. But all of them have to satisfy the same conditions, practically speaking, as for a license at the instance of a private generic manufacturer under section 84. Now, according to us, these conditions were satisfied. So we could ask for a mandatory order um, from the court issued to the government to issue government authorization or compulsory license. Now, the, when we filed it in court, we were heard and the court was satisfied that there was a case. And we had also made a representation to the government, which is required to seek a mandatory order. And on that, the court said that the government must pass an order. Now, the government obviously has to pass an order with reasons if they want to reject it or if they want to grant it. And in fact, they have rejected the, uh, the application for government authorization or compulsory licensing. And now in the last month, um, our friends, the petitioners and others, including MSF Third World Network, we're all working together on this. They filed RTIs, right to information applications to get the exact data and also the notes that the government have, must have made to reject it. So we are at that stage. The moment we get information and we are confident that they are not supplying or making available, making accessible the required number of doses for pedicolin or delaminate. So we are waiting for that. Moment we get the information, we will challenge the order rejecting the issues of government authorization or compulsory licenses. Now, I want to come to the issues that uh, our friends have raised. And I think these are very important issues. Now, obviously, we have to file pattern oppositions. I am for selectively filing pattern oppositions. For that, I think there has to be, you know, discussions amongst the 
communities and people like tag, third world network, et cetera, to actually determining, determining a landscape. Some landscapes have been actually formulated, but out of those, we have to decide which have to be opposed and should we should make a concerted effort around the world to see that it is filed, an opposition is filed to a particular compound all over. But I think we should be selective. I don't think we should file them everywhere. We should be selective. Of course, we should file it in India or South Africa and other Latin American countries. I don't know whether we can file them all over because we don't have the resources to mount uh, challenges everywhere. If we find them in selective important countries where production is based for export, that will be very important. And large countries where people need it. Uh, now, I think there's been a major problem. Civil society has been divided on this on a number of occasions. I found that people are not working together, but that is also changing. In India, we've had a sort of a lax period where civil society hasn't worked together. That has changed with COVID and we are now working together. I don't know about other countries. I think that that is very important uh, to formulate strategies together to decide where and how and which, which application should be filed. Now, secondly, I think we have to realize that the Indian generic industry is in a state of huge transformation. It is no longer the industry which actually provided drugs for altruist, altruistic purposes to the developing world as the pharmacy of the world. There's a massive change going on. And that is very clearly evident in the COVID-19 scenario where the com a company like Cipla, which played a stellar role in the case of HIV medicines, when the crisis was at its highest, in South Africa, and the drugs were available, antiretrovirals from $10,000 to $15,000 per patient per annum. And Dr. Hamid of CIPLA was able to announce that they will supply the antiretroviral triple combination therapy at about $350 US dollars, and they were made available within a year at $700 by even the multinational companies who were otherwise selling earlier at $10,000 to $15,000, CIPLA played a stellar role. But see the change. Today, CIPLA is importing drugs, repurposed drugs from other countries and selling them at exorbitant prices. Tosilozumab is sold in India for nearly $500. That's the state of affairs. I don't see a situation where, unless we file patent oppositions and we get generic companies to produce them, I think we will be in a very, very difficult position. If we succeed in the patent opposition, obviously generic countries, con, 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 uh, con, generic companies will actually uh, produce them. But the first battle is actually filing the oppositions, landscaping, and then actually working out strategies together. I don't see it happening as quickly as it should. People, everybody, unfortunately, we are human beings. Everyone wants to make sure that they get the piece of the cake. And I think that's a disaster for the, for the future. Unless we are able to collaborate and file together, we will be in a very, very difficult situation. Secondly, we are in a situation with the Indian government, as I mentioned earlier, is no longer interested in playing that role that it played prior to 2010, where they were interested in issuing compulsory licensing, where they were interested in making sure that drugs are affordable. The government hasn't done a stitch of work in the COVID scenario to make sure that either vaccines or drugs are available accessible and therefore affordable. To expect them to issue compulsory licenses is going to be very difficult if we don't succeed in patent oppositions. Though we have the best law that is required to get that done. So how do we actually get compulsory licenses issued? 
generic companies are not willing to come forward because it costs a lot of money to go through the procedure of filing an application for compulsory licensing under Section 84, make, try the negotiations out, which itself takes one year, then going to the patent controller to get an application allowed, which will take another six months to one year. That is challenged now in the high court and from the high court, it goes to the Supreme Court. So you have to think about it three years, two, three years, and a lot of money is spent by the companies to do that. So they're not willing to do that. So the real case is again, as Pratiba and Dina have mentioned, is to actually go for pattern oppositions. So we must have a very clear strategy. And for that, I think there is need to have a larger consultation where we can narrow down very strategic compounds, we can then be opposed internationally. Um, uh, also, the last point I want to make is about public funding. A uh, lot has been said about public funding and what is the consequence of that. Of course, you can make a moral argument that because there is a public funding in developing drugs or vaccines, then there's an obligation on them to make them affordable. But that's not a legal argument. You can pressurize them. You can pressurize them, but that's not a legal argument. I'm afraid that we have to think of novel ways of actually challenging this and making a, a, a sort of a, a, an argument which actually then follows onto a legal proposition which can be articulated either in terms of amendments in laws or in terms of court interventions. So I'll stop here because already we are at six, um, you know, 20 minutes left. So if there are questions, I'll be willing to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anand, enlightening as always. Uh, I would like to call our last speaker for today, but before that, just one announcement. If somebody has questions, uh, they can put it in the Q&A box. Uh, there is also an option of raise hand, so they can ask there as well. Questions can be taken in English, uh, but in French and Spanish also. Uh, thank you. Uh, so uh, Mikita, he works with an organization called 100% uh, Life and has been involved in patent opposition in Ukrainian region. And I request him to share his experience in oppositions to new TB drugs, which he has been closely involved in. Mikita, uh, and if you can share your slides, it would be great. Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, good day, good morning, good evening, uh, whatever time of day is where you are. My name is Nikita Trofimenko and I would like to present on uh, patent oppositions relating to uh, anti-TB uh, medicines with a focus on uh, the bedaquilin. Oh, one second, I will uh, share my presentation. Do you want me to share your presentation? Yes, maybe if you can, please, please go ahead okay. because I have some issues. Sure.
Elsa Schild. Oh, thank you. So, um, as we know, uh, evergreening patterns, they are really impeding access to medicines and uh, TB medicines and bedaquiline uh, is not an uh, exception in that regard. Uh, Therefore, in several middle-income countries, uh, patent oppositions have already been submitted uh, in relation to bedaquiline, uh, in particular in Brazil, India, Kyrgyzstan, Moldova, Thailand, uh, Ukraine. Uh, and in my presentation, I would like to uh, promptly discuss our experience uh, focusing more on uh, Ukraine and Moldova as I am uh, directly involved in opposing patents in those countries. Uh, the first slide uh, shows some statistics. Uh, it is about Ukraine, uh, but I'm sure uh, that uh, in other countries, uh, the situation is, uh, uh, more or less the same, especially in middle income countries. Um, we have estimated, we have analyzed uh, uh, patents for essential drugs, uh, for, for essential medicines in Ukraine, uh, according to UNDP uh, guidelines related to patent examinations. And we found out that 45% uh, of uh, patents uh, in Ukraine could be considered as evergreening. Uh, therefore, for example, on only in 2018, uh, the state overpaid uh, about 10 million of dollars on procurement only of four medicines, which is for Ukraine is uh, huge uh, sums. Uh, considering the limited healthcare budget. Uh, also, the big problems is with uh, supplementary protection certificate, uh, which are the case also when we are talking about the bedaquiline. Um, on that slide, we, we see an example how uh, by the misuse of uh, supplementary protection certificate, uh, only in 2018 alone, uh, Ukraine overpaid um, two and a half million dollars on two anti-cancer medicines. Um, and the next slide, uh, uh, we could see uh, the main uh, types of evergreening patents that uh, were submitted for betaquiline and uh, that were opposed in, uh, in different countries uh, around the globe. Uh, the, main, uh, uh, the main ground for uh, op op opposing patents uh, is the lack of inventive step. And sometimes also lack of novelty is used as uh, a legal ground to opposing uh, betaquiline patents. Uh, four main uh, uh, types of patents were uh, uh, opposed uh, around the world. For example, fumarate, uh, patent for fumarate salt, which was opposed in India uh, and Kyrgyzstan and some other countries. Uh, Composition uh, patent application, uh, which is used for uh, bedaquiline pediatric treatment, uh, was opposed in Ukraine. Uh, indication uh, uh, patents were opposed in several countries, including Thailand uh, and Moldova, and formulation patent was opposed in. Uh, 
Thailand. Uh, those oppositions are not uh, yet resolved. Uh, they are uh, under consideration. Uh, there are some preliminary results, for example, for uh, composition uh, patent application, Ukrainian Patent Office issued a preliminary refusal uh, in granting patent. And uh, as far as we know, Janssen changed their patent claims uh, for that patent application. And we are now uh, trying to estimate uh, what uh, changes have been made by, by the, uh, the Janssen, by the originator, in order to um, work on our further strategy. Uh, in the next slide, uh, we could see uh, the main uh, uh, the main uh, nuances that uh, organization uh, should uh, take in mind while uh, opposing uh, bedaquilian patents. Uh, first of all, it's uh, limitation of action. Um, Janssen, it, it, was all, all, it, it was both in Moldova and in uh, Ukraine uh, that Janssen uh, in the court, they claimed that uh, the patent could be uh, opposed only within the limitation of action period, which means uh, uh, within uh, three years after um, uh, patent has been granted and published. After that year, according to Janssen, uh, limitation of action uh, has lapsed and uh, there are no opportunity to oppose that patents. It's actually not only Janssen uh, strategy, but uh, uh, many other pharmaceutical companies uh, uh, while uh, at, at the patent uh, opposition proceedings, they claim and try to refer to uh, the limitation of action legal provisions. So it's important to uh, make a strong case before a court why uh, limitation of action uh, should not be uh, applied in, in, in that situation. Uh, the second is legal standing, uh, obviously, uh, and it's a similar situation with patent opposition that I submitted by civil society, by pet patients organizations, is that uh, defendant Janssen, they claim that uh, a pet, a patient organization uh, doesn't have uh, legal standing to uh, oppose uh, a patent that only uh, like other pharmaceutical uh, companies have a uh, right to oppose patents. That's why it is uh, also in, the, in, in your claim, uh, it is uh, important to uh, to show uh, legal provisions, to refer maybe to the legal practice that demonstrates that uh, uh, patient organizations and civil society, uh, the same as uh, all other uh, interested parties um, have right to uh, oppose uh, patents in the court. Uh, the third Make one is... Uh, is, sorry, but can I request you to uh, wrap up in the next couple of minutes, please? We're really Could running. You, could you please repeat? Hello. I, yeah, I'm just saying that can you wrap up in the next couple of minutes? Uh, we are running short of time. We will. Yes, yes, just time just uh, just two minutes more. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, so. Um, uh, the third nuance, which is uh, important, is solid scientific support of a claim. So uh, 
uh, it is uh, important to provide uh, strong arguments against novelty, against inventive step uh, of the patents uh, or patent applications, uh, to refer to certain publications, patents, um, and other uh, documents or literature to uh, prove that um, opposed patents uh, and patent applications, the uh, lack of novelty and inventive step. Uh, while we were preparing our uh, patent oppositions in Ukraine, it was uh, very useful for us to uh, use uh, documents from uh, shared by our by civil society organization from Thailand and Brazil, and actually there are uh, several uh, patent oppositions they, that are uh, uploaded on uh, MSF patent uh, oppositions dot org website, and that can be uh, accessed there. And it is very important and uh, uh, very useful source uh, of uh, arguments against uh, uh, patents for bedaculin. And uh, the last uh, is that is, it is uh, always uh, more uh, effective to, um, and it is more prompt, and it is. Uh, uh, it is more affordable to uh, oppose uh, patents before they have been granted, but we are pre-grant uh, procedure, uh, pre-grant pre opposition if it is possible. So thanks for your attention. If you would like to uh, have any information, would uh, like to ask uh, some arguments that we have used uh, uh, while opposing patents for betaqualine, please contact me and I will be happy to share. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Miketa. And uh, thanks everyone else. Uh, we will take some questions now, uh, but maybe I can just pose the first question and something that I'm always very intrigued about, which is that, uh, and as Anand also mentioned, we uh, earlier it used to be a bit different where uh, the generic industry was also uh, uh, fighting against the patents and would file patent oppositions, but all uh, that has reduced and it has fallen absolutely on the civil society and the activists to file, uh, to fight against the patents and the uh, a legal strategy is an important one out of that. Uh, but what about the political will and uh, the rest of the environment that has changed in terms of patents? So maybe Lena or Anand uh, uh, could uh, come in and let us know how do we look at this change uh, and how can we respond to this? All the panelists can switch on their videos. Let Lena go first. I want to say something uh, uh, in response to uh, Mikita uh, later, if you if you will allow me. If you want, I can go first and also on, you know, respond to Mikita. And Lindsay has a point for us. Yeah. Lindsay has actually put something on the chat box. Which I see. Yeah, yeah, Anand, go ahead. I'm here. I think the Please political environment is changed completely in India. And unless civil society pressurizes the government, and I don't think the pressure is going to work by normal lobbying, we'll have to be very smart in going to court, like we have done in the TB petition. So the TB petition will set a very, very important precedent. So that's why we are not rushing into uh, the stage now is they have they have actually refused to grant either government authorization or a compulsory license. Um, and we had written to Lindsay actually uh, and tried to put pressure on the US government. But I think the US government, I don't know what the standard, maybe Lindsay can actually tell us the USTR in the context of COVID-19 has taken a soft stand. But my understanding, 
and Lindsay can correct me. And my understanding based on uh, my friends who are in the Democratic Party base is because the Democratic Party base has become quite left-wing and they are pushing the top. It's not that Biden is a nice guy and he wants to, you know, he's quite better than, much better than uh, Mr. Donald Trump, but uh, the pressure from the base is very strong. So I think uh, because now we are at a stage when we are getting the right to information, moment we get the information showing that enough is not made available which is required, we'll be able to go to court and argue, which will take another two weeks, I think, to get our right to information. Information. Uh, that's one. Secondly, I, I don't know whether we should actually expose the Indian government or not in the international circles, but somehow we should bring it to the notice of other people that this is a duplicitous stand that the government of India is taking in the TRIPS Council, they're making out they're in favor of TRIPS waiver, but they are behaving exactly in the opposite manner in India. So I don't know what, what we should do, but I think we should uh, somehow bring it to the notice of other governments, particularly South Africa, which is really pushing the TRIPS waiver uh, forward. Okay, this to um, uh, uh, respond to Mikita, I think, I mean, it's great to see the Ukrainian activists being very, very um, active. Um, but just as a matter of information, I don't know if you have it. If you have it, of course, uh, it will be of no use. But we had got an order from the, uh, the procedure in India is that you first go to the patent controller and until recently, the appeal lie, lay to the intellectual property appellate board, then to the high court, then to the Supreme Court. The IPAB has now been abolished is directly from patent controller to the high court or Supreme Court. But we had an order, which is still valid, that an NGO working on uh, issues of access to medicine is a person interested, and therefore it has a locus to file an opposition. I'll, if you send me your email, Nikita, I will send you the judgment. And uh, uh, so I think there, there's also a tie uh, order from Thailand, which I'll also send you. So you can use them in your case. Uh, on the issue of limitation, uh, the general law, I don't know, Ukraine, because it's a civil law country, I will not venture a guess, but in common law countries, limitation applies generally to civil or criminal courts. They are courts traditionally. In tribunals, which are different, they're not courts in the proper sense, there, the statute which actually sets them up and governs the application of that law has to provide for a procedure of limitation. Or there is a provision that the general statute of limitation applies. It's a complex technical argument, but if you want any help on that, you know, we can send you a note which may help you. It's up to you, of course. I mean, also, I agree with. Nikita, actually um, exchanging information between the opposition uh, groups is very important. And uh, uh, we have got a lot of oppositions underway, uh, but the only difference is on the 3D, as you know, on novelty, on inventive step and other things, uh, the arguments are very common. So we should exchange um, our oppositions and the other thing is of translations. I did try, um, uh, Sergey had sent me one of the things from Russia. I tried Google translation. It worked quite well. I could understand the, the case. So I think we should try to set up mechanisms where we can actually assist each other. Now, the ITPC has uh, the Asian Patent Opposition Academy where I gave two lectures the, uh, the last month on actual oppositions, how to, you know, how they're conducted and all that. So I think we should tie up with ITPC and make sure that all MSF or Third World Network are all together to make sure that the exchange of information is facilitated and tag. Tag is very important. 
uh, exchange of information is facilitated in terms of oppositions, in terms of language translation, so that we get the immediate information that um, something is filed in Ukraine. This is the Ukrainian um, version of it, and we get it in English. And if we have something more to say, because we have more information, we give it to them. That's very important because that's where the battle is going to be. The generic companies are not going to fight because they are wood and they're sleeping with the enemy, as it were, by getting voluntary licenses, especially if it's Gilead. If it is Otsuka or Johnson, they're not interested. They don't go into voluntary licenses. So it depends on the company. But I think we should work out and maybe have a meeting on working out strategies. This is good um, information, but I think st strategic and tactical decision making also was to, um, actually has to be worked out in conjunction with all the opposition groups that are working on this thing. So I think a more detailed uh, roadmap in terms of what Lindsay and Pratiba talked about, what are the key drugs that we have to oppose, okay? And then who will oppose it? What is the status in different countries, et cetera? You need to work that out and, you know, some people do that. And as a lawyer, I tell you, it's very difficult to do that. We try to do that in the Lawyers Collective. And if you do that work, two of your people are just working and they don't have time for oppositions. So we, we, we will concentrate on your oppositions and the mapping is rightly done by people like TAG and Third World Network and maybe MSF. So we need to coordinate which are the drugs that we need to oppose. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. Lena, uh, would you like to add two things? Yeah, just quickly to say that uh, you know when you when you work on these oppositions and you're working on very early on, majority of the companies are not around at that time because you're working on very early stages. So it's very important to to be uh, be clear that you are going to be doing this at a very early stage. Um, adding on the on the role of the Indian industry, I think they keep changing quite a lot. I think the big ones are pretty much contract manufacturers for, for Big Pharma. Um, the others are more interesting. Um, so I think we really need to, to um, look at how the generic associations are working. Um, and, and, and what is really key now is both the IPA and IDMA in India are failing. And this is very, it's going to be a challenging job if, if in India generic associations fail, then of course, you know, in other places, it's even more difficult. So I think these are a couple of points. I don't think so. There's, what is happening in India is new to anybody. It happens everywhere in the generic industry. Um, and and uh, lastly, thank you for, for some of the information that you shared from Ukraine and TAG and so on. Thank you so much. Sorry. Yeah, uh, there are many questions regarding the uh, recording of this webinar. So yes, it is being recorded and uh, it will be posted on the YouTube channels of PHM and TWN within a couple of days. Uh, so people can go back to this. Uh, just coming to the questions from the Q&A uh, uh, section. Uh, there's a question for Pratiba, which she has answered, but I'll speak it out so that uh, we have uh, uh, in other languages also. If, can reach people. Uh, the current presentation has shown that the geographical scope covers Kenya. We as East African Health Platform work across six East uh, African countries. Aren't the other countries like Tanzania uh, of interest? Uh, Pratiba, would you like to respond to this? How should I read out? Yeah, uh, yeah okay. I've already responded to her. Um, see, um, Tanzania is part of Aripo, and we have covered Aripo. So if Aripo, uh, if uh, any patent is granted in Aripo, then it will be applicable to countries uh, which comes under Aripo, including Tanzania. But Tanzania is a, is an is an is an LDC, and they should not be implementing TRIPS. So if there are, uh, so a national uh, action should be taken so as to uh, you know implement the. The pharmaceutical transition period. 
So that's what I wanted to highlight here. Thank you, Pratima. Uh, is by Peter. Uh, I know this discussion is mostly about drugs, but the question of adjuvants for vaccines is an interesting and challenging one. The GSQS21, a GSKSQS21 and the Novavax Matrix AM are both uh, saponin based and are treated by these companies as platform technologies that they aim to make a lot of products from, not just one. Uh, the question is, uh, what are the prospects for unlocking the pipeline based on these compounds? Uh, maybe Lindsay, would you like to take this question? Yeah, I think it is a really good question. And part of the reason we wanted to include the TB vaccine candidate M72 in the presentation, I think, um, you know, I think a lot of vaccine companies in particular are looking, as you say, at these types of platform technologies that they can use to deliver um, vaccines for all different things. And so uh, potentially focusing in on the adjuvant, for example, in this case, um, the AS01E, which includes QS21 um, may, if you focus in on, on it for one thing, it may help um, unlock access to the same adjuvant that is used to deliver um, other vaccines. So I think this is a, an area that deserves more attention. My colleague, Mike Frick, is really the expert on this. If you look at the, the there's a link on one of the slides, his pipeline report chapter in 2019 actually focused very heavily on um, the adjuvant. And it talks about um, actually that the, the QS21 molecules derived from the soap bark tree. And there's a lot of um, history around um, indigenous knowledge and use. Um, and so I know one thing, you know, Mike has been interested in exploring is opportunities to leverage the Nagoya protocol and, and benefit sharing um, to try to as one kind of strategy for trying to unlock um, access to the adjuvant. So yeah, this is definitely an area of, of interest, especially as the TB vaccine candidate is entering phase three um, and GSK really has, has a monopoly. Um, on that adjuvant, which is important for TB, but also um, other areas as well. Thank you. Uh, uh, thanks. Uh, so this is for Pumesa. Thanks for the very touching personal experience, Pumesa. Apart from MSN, are there other clinics or hospitals which today provide treatment for multiple resistance TB in South Africa? Well, yes. I mean, most clinics, they do offer the, the MDR-TB drugs that include the new drug called the better quality. And then if you are too sick, there is a hospital called Brooklyn Chest Hospital, and then they also offer the, the, the better quality drug. So it, it's sort of like a replace the injectable that got me there. So yes, there are clinics out there besides MSF that offer MDR-TB treatment. Thank you. Uh, uh, Pallavi has uh, asked from, uh, has uh, addressed to Anand and Lina, uh, thoughts on the translatability of orders by the SC and other HC in terms of the COVID epidemic, where the central government has been asked to take responsibility of providing vaccine for the declared epidemic in India. These orders would carry precedence as law now and would be applicable to TB as well. Uh, any response, Lena or Anand, on this? Yeah, I mean, the government is not denying that they need to provide the treatment. Uh, so if you read the guidelines, Pallavi, they've listed both new drugs today as treatments uh, for XDR, PXDR, uh, and of course, vedaculin containing core regimen uh, to remove the injectable uh, for MDR. So they're not denying that they're not denying the fact that uh, uh, th these are, you know, what, what the regimen should be. I think ultimately, I think the difference between COVID and TB is an issue of just size. I mean, COVID affects everybody in this country and therefore it's become a political issue. While TB, you know, I, I mean, it's hard to say this, but it is uh, an issue that is far more seen as, as an issue of marginalization and poverty and receives completely different 
uh, you know, uh, I would say a different way it is, is it's treated in, in, uh, in terms of politics. So you, the kind of attention you're seeing from the Supreme Court on COVID-19 is absolutely unprecedented. We've never seen that in TB, one. Number two is this TB, we already established that, you know, patients should get treatment free of cost. Government has been agreeing to it. The challenge ultimately has been the mindset of bureaucrats uh, who, who keep saying this, that, you know, India cannot issue compulsory license. We think it's going to be detrimental to the country. So I think it doesn't work as a, as a precedent the way, you know, uh, the COVID COVID nineteen decision doesn't work as a precedent in TV. LC for payment made by Anand that. Ah, someone's yeah yeah, Anand. Well, I think there's a major difference with the way the government is treating COVID and TB. Um, the way I mean, they admit that COVID is an emergency, but there is a reluctance on the part of the government to say it's not, not an emergency, QA TB. So that is one major difference. And secondly, uh, they are saying compulsory license is not required. Uh, but even in, even in COVID, they are not interested in issuing any compulsory licenses. So though there's a difference, and I think in, in my uh, personal opinion, both of them, COVID-19 and uh, TB in India are emergencies. Both of them admit of issuing compulsory licenses or government use. It's very strange to see that the government is taking this absolutely unsustainable stance. But uh, Lena is right that uh, I think Lena is right that um, um, you know the risk Perception in the court has been more uh, in terms of the uh, some cases, for example, food and all, which the order came here today. Uh, we were there in the court and they have been very favorable on allowing certain things. In the matter which is going on on vaccines and other things, they have also been critical of the government, which has actually made the government change its stand. They're not happy with the court. But I hope the court goes further um, uh, in this because they, the, the, the government has been filing affidavit after affidavit and claiming everything is hunky dory, which is not the case. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, we have uh, shot over the time limit quite a bit, but uh, just one comment and one short question. Uh, Joel has commented that generic companies are also being bought over by the issuance of voluntary licenses by Big Pharma. This is spares generic companies, the cost and human resources needed to seek CL. I think this is something that Anand had already covered and uh, Lino also uh, sort of spoke about. Uh, uh, but this is a question which is, uh, how can we get to learn okay. uh, Sorry, I was muted. Uh, there's a question. How can we get to learn more about the petition just to get a clearer understanding of what it entails? Now, Anand, I think this is uh, the petition the government used. Petition. Okay, yeah, we can, uh, I mean, we can make it available to uh, them. I mean, I think uh, somebody can help out in putting it on the website or what have you, because technically it will be, um, who wants to put it on the website and we can put it or we can circulate it. There's no difficulty in uh, making the petition available. Mm. So you tell me who wants it and it, there's no copyright on it. So there's no question. Right. Uh, so I think it should, uh, it will be available publicly soon. One of the organizations can put it. Uh, and there is yeah. Uh, one form. Yeah. Yes. We have been circulating to everybody who's been asking us. There's been no uh, issue with that. I think if we are to put it in the public domain and all the allied documents that go with it, including the government's response, then we'll have to speak to the petitioners once and come back uh, and confirm that. Right. Okay. So, and Joel has a comment, which uh, uh, otherwise Anand and Lena have already covered, that generic companies are also being bought over 
by the issuance of voluntary licenses by big pharma. Uh, this is spares generic companies the cost and human resources needed to seek CL. So, um, and uh, just one last question, I think, uh, to Fumeza. Uh, what is the JNJ drug that Fumeza is using? Uh, Fumeza, if you can clarify on that. No, I don't think uh, it was part of the transition and transition. I think it's the people pronounce it differently. Limbs of it or lines of it. I'm not sure if you know that drug. Limbs of it or lines of it, but I was not part of the, the beta choline and other new drugs now. So, uh, just to add, Fumisa has challenged the JNJ drug beta choline and its uh, uh, further extension of the patent. Yeah, but she didn't use it. Um, so I think, uh, okay, Lena, your hand is raised. You wanna come in? Yeah, so I just wanna simply say that even if we were to go by, say, voluntary licenses, who's giving the voluntary licenses? Otsuka and JNG have just completely flat refused to give any voluntary licenses. So, I mean, TV is at the bottom of the pile on access. Uh, and, and I mean, if you look at it, I mean, the way anybody would challenge uh, J&J or Pfizer or even for that matter, um, you know, the way we've been challenging Serum Institute and AstraZeneca, no one questions Otsuka in the same way. For some reason, even within MSF, there's a hesitancy to challenge Otsuka. I don't know what it is about a company in Japan that, you know, sort of it's, it's almost a hands-off in terms of campaigning against it. And, and it's got to be spot free by, you know, allowing patients to die. I would just simply say this. Um, I think it's, it's, it's as a treatment activist, I have never ever seen a company get away, a pharmaceutical corporation get away with what Otsuka has got away. And among the treatment access movement, Deliminate has never been an issue because perhaps it started off as, you know, Bedekulin being the priority and not eliminate. But in India, we just saw this, that you couldn't do it with one drug. And, and, and unfortunately, uh, a lack of campaigning around, you know, putting pressure on Otsuka uh, has come too late or will not never come now. In 23 is the expiry of the patent. And, and we just have to live with the fact that many of the patients have died or will die uh, till 2023 when the drug becomes generic. And one of the TB companies either, you know, Macloids or Lupin or one of them will just put out a generic. Uh, so I think we just, we just have to acknowledge that we have completely failed on, on Otsuka, yeah. And, and the patent they have on Delimonic. Yeah. Oh, on that not very happy note, uh, and but recognizing our own failures, uh, I think we can close this webinar. I thank all the speakers for such wonderful presentations and uh, arguments that they post and give so much of information. And thanks for everyone who attended the meeting. Um, it, uh, it's been almost two hours, but uh, I think we have quite a few people who attended. Thanks everyone. And we'll keep coming back to you with all these discussions and uh, um, yeah, and the strategies that we take forward. Thank you. <laughs>